evening, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua, chapter 1. We're going to be there now, probably, well, let me say it this way. We'll be there at least until the fall. Hopefully we'll get done somewhere around then. But we will take a little hiatus uh, around the Resurrection Sunday. Um, we'll put some things on the Easter celebration, those sorts of things. So to be ready for that, as well as uh, uh, next month, that will actually with the... I'm not sure which Sunday exactly it will be, but there's going to be a special presentation uh, on the book of Esther for the Feast of Pure. So uh, it reminds me that uh, Brother Richard is going to be teaching the book of Esther in adult class for the next month. So that will be interesting in five weeks. And then uh, we're going to have a presentation in here on the book of Esther. That will be very special. So those things are coming up, and I uh, look forward to that. And then when we do that, I'm going to break away from what we're studying now. I'm going to actually give a message on and Esther. Uh, for such a time as this, because you know, the climax of that book is one of the things Esther comes to the point says, you know, maybe it's for such a time as this the Lord has brought me here. And so uh, that's an exciting portion of scripture. So look forward to that. We we and today I want to invite you to take your, your Bibles as well as your sermon notes and, and pull them out and follow along with the message today. Uh, I, I gave this message a special title, keeping your blankments from being your from being blankments, which you're wondering what words go in there. That this, this whole message about is about Israel and their uh, commitment to the Lord and their their following the Lord. And, I, and as I laid this together, I felt the Lord's tugging at my heart to talk to you today about keeping your commitments uh, from being omitments. And that's what we're talking about today. Because one of the greatest tragedies of life is to be have a commitment and make it not keep it. So often things go on and, and, and someone says something and so you, you hear a need and you raise your hand or you fill out something and then it goes by the wayside. Your commitment you made suddenly is now an omen. It goes on again. You hear something else and you raise your hand you commit and then you, you don't follow through and you make another commitment and you don't follow through. I know from my personal life one of the the most difficult things for me has been through my childhood. I remember a situation with my my father and, and the other kids. Now, I, I grew up in a family with seven brothers and sisters, so there were a lot of us. And the, the latter ones of us, we were outside messing around with my dad, and the other kids all got to do something with dad, and my turn came, and I never got to do it. And I was really disappointed. And my dad made me a promise that one day we would, we would get back together and we would do it. And, and you know, all my years, that never happened. And so I always have that thing like I wasn't as important as the others and, and so on. And, and so, you know, we, we make commitments. And, and I've, I'm a father. I have three children. And I always look back and I wonder, did, were there commitments I made to my children that I ended up making into an omen that I never fulfilled it? They made their promises and didn't follow through with them. And, and sometimes we do that. We, we make promises and commitments. And, and when we get into Joshua chapter 1 today, Joshua is, is asked to follow through with his commitment to serve the Lord. When you're in Joshua chapter 1, uh, I'm going to bypass the topic that we're talking about here. I'm going to read for you in a little bit of Joshua chapter 1, the earlier portion, since, since Don already read what we are studying on today. Let me go to you from the very beginning of the chapter, in chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that... that that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, and all this pe people to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel, every place on which you, the sole of your foot treads I have given to you, just as I have spoken to Moses, in the wilderness of this Lebanon, even as far as the great river Euphrates, to the land of the Hittites, even as far as the great sea, for the setting of the sun. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, but just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you today, and I'm asking that you do a work in our hearts. This could be a, one of those messages that really mean a lot, because we have husbands and wives here, we have fathers and daughters and, and, and sons and the children and grandchildren. Uh, Lord, and sometimes we, we, we say things and we promise things and we don't fulfill them. We, and, and I know sometimes we just need to be reminded of the fact that we made a promise. And Lord, 
you called Joshua, you, you asked him to be the leader of the people, and he accepted, and now he's asked to do something, and he needs to follow through, just as we do. So Lord, bless now in this time of opening your word and the time of study. Lord, I pray for those today with special needs. I know for Sheila, it's been a time of loss of her brother-in-law. We, we pray for her and her family and, and, and what's going on there. And then, Lord, as Tom is here today, we pray for him and his family, for Sarah. And, and Lord, as, as Kathy went home to be with the Lord on Monday, we, we just pray for your grace and your comfort. And, and Lord, um, I, I thank you for your promises. I thank you for your word that we know that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. We know that one day we get to be home with you according to the promise of your word when we leave by faith. And so, Lord, since that is true, help us to, to trust in you and live for you. And, Lord, just as you promised Joshua, you will never leave him or forsake him. And that promise enables him to fulfill the commitments he makes. And so, Lord, comfort and guide us today as we're here and speak to our hearts. Thank you for the ministries we have, for the Iwana Club, for the Sunday School, for all of our working and laboring. Bless them in a special way. And Lord, guard our hearts and minds today. Let us be focused on you. Speak to us, we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So there's a few things for you to fill out today. I've put in your sermon notes the, the, the scripture for today, so you can follow along there. But I want to just make some pretty simple points this morning. And I want to fill them in a little bit because as we're talking this morning, we're, we're reading something in Joshua chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. We begin there, and it says, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the midst of the camp, and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you are to cross the Jordan. Can you imagine those words? Forty years of wandering in the wilderness. And now they stand with Joshua, and Joshua says, just get everything ready, because in three days we're going across that Jordan into the promised land. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, they'd be jumping up and down. I imagine there was a shout, because these were uh, uh, not like our stoic believers we have today. These were, were Jewish uh, <laughs> brethren, and they usually get a little more excited sometimes. Uh, and, and so I imagine there was a lot of celebration going on here, and, and just... And, you know, what they heard from Joshua to go, he, actually, he spoke to the leaders. Uh, they commanded the officers. And the officer is a term that is really, uh, it's an interesting term because it's more like an administrator. Like, they were the groups who administrated over the, the groups of people or the tribes. And so uh, it, it comes from a, a Hebrew word and associated with Egypt and the, the ones who keep the records for the people. And he's saying, so you are the guys that need to go and take this message now and communicate it with others. And so that's what he's saying to them. And he tells them, just go through the camp and tell everyone to get ready. So what do we learn here? Well, the first thing we learn today is to fulfill any commitment uh, that you make at the very first opportunity. And for Joshua, God told him to go into the promised land. I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. In fact, if you read verse 9, it says, have I not commanded you? So now be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And you know what's really cool right here? We, make, we are to make plans as quickly as possible. And look at the first word. Then, he says to him, then, or it says in our Bible, then Joshua, as soon as he got done with God speaking to them, he turned and he gathers the leaders and he says, and then he spoke to them and says, now we, God told us to go, let's go. Let's not think about it. Let's not wonder about it. Let's not fear for it. And if God is calling in your life for any purpose, and you've said, yes, I want to I teach a Sunday school class. I want to work in Awanas. I want to work in this ministry. I want to do this or that. And if God says something to you, and you feel it in your heart, and you, you say, Lord, I'm willing to do that, don't stop. Just say, Lord, I'm going to commit to that right now. And I can tell you, God will give you the grace, whatever is necessary for service. In fact, I... I I said something to Ed this morning because it just took me back. I don't know why the Lord brought this to mind, but but we were just a year ago. We were in the process of working in, in, in Alice's home and, and set like two, three days a week, every week, you know, for a long period of time. And and I said, you know, I don't know how we even did it last year because I'm so busy right now. I got things in my mind and I got things I'm working on. And how did we fit that in there? And I, and I just said, you know, it had to be the grace of God that He just. When he calls you to do something, you just say yes to it. You don't have to understand all the particulars of it. You just move forward. Joshua could have raised a lot of questions. Well, how are we going to get across the Jordan? Are there enough boats for us to do this thing? How are we going to get, what's going to happen when we get there? He could have thought of all kinds of things and said, you know, I don't know that I'm really ready for this right now. Let's take a break and let's, let's relax here for a few weeks. 
they never follow through with it. We need to just follow through and, and do as the Lord calls us and commands us. The best time to act in that commitment is now. Whenever we come to it, we just say, Lord, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to follow through. I'm going to act on my commitments. I found it kind of an amusing story. It's a true story, actually. Uh, I think the gentleman's name was, was Thomas Higgins. Uh, he was from Quebec, Canada. And, and, and as the story goes, his house was on fire. Now, this is the days when you have the, the old landline. So he went, went to the, his living room was burning up. And so he goes to the kitchen and he calls the police. And, and right before he's go out the door, all of a sudden the phone rings and a, and a reporter calls him. The reporter wants to interview him about his house burning down. <laughs> and he says, I, I can assure you that, and Aaron says, well, your house can't be on, very badly on fire because you're talking. And he says, I am. I said, I'm in the room. I'm ready to get out the door. But, but, but I, just, I just need to get going here. And the reporter uh, tries to ask him more questions. He says, look, he says, and, he, and the, now you can hear the crackle of the fire. And so and he says, I really need to get going. But he says, you can do one thing for me. And the reporter says, well, what is that? What can I do for you? Your house is on fire. You need to get going. He says, would you please call the circulation room and cancel my subscription because I won't be living here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he at least had the commitment to cancel his subscription in the midst of tiger circumstances. And you know, you think about these things, and sometimes we make commitments. And you know, the opposite of commitment, the opposite of taking action in your commitments, is really apathy. It's easy to say something to someone and say, I'm going to do this and then not follow through. And I ask you a question, how many of you have made a New Year's resolution? And if you did, how well are you following through on it? Sometimes Christians have decided, I'm going to read through the Bible this year, or I'm going to have a quiet time every day, or I'm going to do this, Lord, I'm going to promise this, I'm going to promise that. And we get into the year, and, and that commitment is now an omen. I may be stepping on a few toes today, but I know sometimes husbands promise their wives they're going to do this or fix that. And yes, honey, I know the list is there. I'm going to get to it. Uh, you know, we have commitments. And we say we're going to do things, but we don't do them. Or wives to their husbands, you know, I'm going to take care of this work and you don't do it. Or sometimes parents and children, I told you about my father. And there are things that sometimes eventually leave scars on our lives because we have commitments and we, we don't follow through with them. And I want to encourage you, you know, at the first opportunity, not only fulfill the commitment, but organize others who are part of that commitment. Because in this situation, it wasn't just Joshua that was going to the promised land that he committed for. It was Joshua and all the people needed to cross the Jordan. Now let me go back a little bit. I want to read for you a couple things. That last week I, I had more for you on the, the background of the book, and some of you weren't here, so you'll really enjoy hearing this. But I, I forgot, I was going to read some other sheets, and I thought, no, I'm going to wait, because I forgot these sheets at home, and I want to read this for you. But first of all, about the, the background of the book, the date of the writing is kind of interesting, because two dates for the book of, this, of, the book of Joshua are defended by scholars. Some defend the date uh, parallel to the 19th century dynasty of Egypt in the 1300 B.C. The events, however, may be safely dated, and this is the preferred uh, understanding of when this was written, in the late 15th and early 14th centuries B.C. In 1 Kings 6.1, we read this. In the 480th year of the sun, excuse me, in the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. And so if you date back from there, this date for the beginning of the temple construction would be the spring of 966 B.C. So you count back 480 years in history and to the exodus from Egypt and then add 40 years in the wilderness wanderings. And one arrives at the conclusion that the book of Joshua was written somewhere between 405 and 406 B.C. And for entrance into land, this also... A, a, fits the first, the 300 years later indicated uh, by Jephthah in Judges 11 26. I thought it was fascinating to read you know, how precise you can be when you sit there and calculate all these things out. Let me just read this as well. The events of the book of Joshua cover 25 to 30 years. The three initial campaigns took about seven years. If Joshua was 79 years old at the time of the invasion, he would be approximately 110 at his death. The total period would cover about 
31 years, from 1406 to 1375 B.C. And I want to read that to you because that's some of the background of the book. And let me just tell you a little bit of the history because we're getting into something now. The next point, as we talked about this morning, is um, challenge others to fulfill the commitments that they make. And listen to this. This is just some background information that I wanted to give to you. It says, the biblical book of Joshua opens with Israel on the eastern bank of the Jordan River. Now, on your notes, if you've got your notes, you can see uh, you've got the river running down there. Um, there's a map on your, on your notes. Cover that up here. So you can follow along. You can look there. And, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. That's not really for that purpose, but I wanted to mention that. But on the eastern bank of the Jordan River, the memory of the Egyptian bondage is only four decades old. The people of Israel are younger. Those over 20 after the Exodus perished in the wilderness. Moses had just passed away, and the mourning for the great legislator of Israel, that is Moses, has, has drawn to a close at Josh, as Joshua assumes leadership of the nation. The reader joins Israel as the people prepare to enter the land and take possession as God had promised Abraham four centuries earlier in Genesis 13. Prior to the death of Moses, a great leader affirmed the request to the two and a half tribes, Reuben and Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, which brings us to where we are now. I'm not going to read any more from that. But the next point is this, that if others have a commitment and you know about it, then encourage them to fulfill their commitments. Any commitments anyone makes, a verbal promise should always be kept. If you make a promise about something, don't be afraid, but you... Uh, but keep it. And in this case, Joshua had the responsibility to not only fulfill this, but also to make sure that others keep their, their promise. And this takes place, if you turn in your Bibles to Numbers 32, you're going to see something here. This is kind of interesting. So as you're reading here in verses 15, and, or excuse me, in verses 12, it says, To the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half of the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said... Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God will give you rest and will give you this land. Now, some of you are saying, well, who in the world are the Reubenites, who are the Gadites, and who, are, who, are, who is a half-tribe of Manasseh? Because Manasseh is not one of the sons of Jacob. And so you, you've got to understand a little bit of, of, of Israel history here in order to really understand what's going on here. So back in Numbers 32, a portion that we did not study, we, we read something here. It says, Now the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the exceedingly narc had a large number of livestock. Uh, Exodus 32, verse 1. So when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that it was indeed a place suitable for livestock, the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben came to the people, came and spoke to the Moses and to Eliade to the priest. And the leaders of, of the congregation saying, and they list a number of the leaders here, I'm not going to read all that for you. The land which the Lord conquered before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock and for your servants. And they said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. So that's who they are. There's the, there, there are the Reubenites and the Gadites, and later on it includes the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now, some of you are saying, well, who is the half-tribe of Manasseh? Well, when Joseph was in Egypt, remember, Joseph uh, was there for all those years, was the one who was thrown into the well and, and came back to life. And Jacob, his father, thought that Joseph was dead. Jacob is now going to be, have his name changed to Israel. And Israel, or Jacob, has 12 sons. Joseph is the second to last, son number 11, who was thrown into the pit. They thought he was going to be left dead there. And yet he was rescued by God in a very special way. And while Joseph is in Egypt later on, they unknown to Jacob that he's even alive or to his brothers that he's alive, Jacob is married and has two sons. They are Ephraim and they are Manasseh. And God has a special role for them. And you're picking up on that. And actually you pick up on that if you go all the way back. And I'm not going to have everybody turn there, but I want to read for you a little bit from the book of the 48th chapter you want to put this in your notes, just write Genesis 48, because I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but you're going to want to read this, because it's really pretty cool, especially if you know anything about Jacob. Remember, Jacob had a brother, Esau. Now, how many of you know who was older, Jacob or Esau? Esau. Esau was older, 
And so Esau should have gotten the, the birthright, but remember Jacob was the tricky guy, and Jacob came in and, and tricked his father to give him the birthright. So we get we pick up in, into Genesis chapter 48, and we're in a situation here. It says, now when they came about after these things, I'm going to read the first several verses for you, just because it's kind of kind of it leads into the story, and I'll just tell you the rest. It says, Now it came about after these things that Joseph was told, Behold, your father, that is Israel or Jacob, is sick. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, when it was told to Jacob, Behold, your son Joseph has come to you. Israel collected his strength and sat up. So Jacob sits up in bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appointed, appeared to me at Luz and in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and numerous. I will make you a company of peoples and will give this land to your descendants. In other words, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so as you go on for it, it says, Now for your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt, behold, I come to you in, before I came to you in Egypt. Let me read it again because I twisted the words. Now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine, Ephraim and Manasseh, and they shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon are. And so what he's saying to me, he says, look, I'm going to adopt your two sons and I'm going to give them the right of inheritance. And so when you list the 12 tribes of Israel, you're going to list 10 tribes the 11th tribe, the tribe of Levites, when you list it out, Levi, Levi is the, the tribe of the priest. And so when later on we get in the book of Joshua, and I'll explain this again because you're going to look at me like, Pastor, this sounds kind of crazy. But Levi does not get an inheritance. They are an assembly of priests. And what God does is he puts throughout all the 12 tribes, he puts a cities of refuge where the, the Levites live and, they, and people can go there with their problems. And so it's kind of an interesting thing. We're going to get to that eventually. But so you've got the ten tribes, and Levi doesn't get inheritance, and so the other two tribes that get an inheritance are the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Manasseh. Now here's what's really interesting, and this is what you can read about in the rest of the 48th chapter of, of, of Genesis. If you go to the 48th chapter of Genesis, you read it. So hey, Joseph is about to give a blessing. And you remember, I mean Jacob is about to give a blessing to the two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So they bring the two sons to them. And so Joseph, wanting the older one, Manasseh, to get the blessing, he brings him to, to the right hand for the, the hand of power, which is always the symbol of authority, and he's going to bless Manasseh, and the left hand is for Ephraim. Only, you remember who Jacob is? He's the supplant, he's the tricky one. When he gets ready to give him a blessing, the chapter tells you, he crosses his hands, and he gives the blessing to Ephraim, and Ephraim becomes the greater tribe, and Manasseh. Now, who is from the tribe of Ephraim that we're looking at in this book? Remember what it says about Joshua, the son of Nun? He was of the tribe of Ephraim. And so he's receiving this blessing, and now we're in the tribe. And so the Reubenites and the Gadites, in, in Numbers 32, it tells us the story that here's what's going on. I'm not going to read the whole chapter for you because I would love to. I'll just, I, I just do it not for the sake for the sake of not having the time this morning. I won't read it all, but let me just say what's going to, what's going to happen here. So they come to Moses in Numbers 32, and they're asking the truth. This is the two, two and a half tribes, and they say, we want the, the inheritance on this side of the Jordan. Now, let me ask you a question. I think Moses is happy with this or upset with that? Nobody wants to guess. Nobody knows the story. What happens is Moses gets upset with them. And he says, why in the world would you want to cause a division amongst our people? You remember how your fathers did all these things in the wilderness, and they, they, they forsook God, and they forsook their brethren, and, and God had to punish them. Now you're wanting to divide our land, and you're not wanting to go with us. And so they make a, co a covenant with Moses. It says in verse 16, then they came near to him and says, we will build here a sheep flock for our fold, for our livestock, but we ourselves will be armed and ready to go before the sons of Israel. Numbers 32, 16. In other words, they say that our sons, our warriors, are going to go with the children of Israel. They will cross the Jordan before them, and they will enter the land of, Israel, uh, the land of promise that they were promised. And so they make that commitment that they will be the ones. And so as you read through here, he says, we will not return to our homes until every one of our sons, or every one of the sons of Israel has possessed their inheritance. For we will not have an inheritance with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond because our inheritance has fallen to us on this side of the Jordan. 
And so basically what happens is Moses promises them. In fact, we come in verse 20 and it says, Moses said to them, if you will do this, that if you will arm yourselves before the Lord for the war, and all, the, and, and all of you armed men cross the Jordan before the Lord until his, he has driven out the enemies of, and be from before him, and the land is subdued before the Lord, then afterward you shall return to be free of your obligation toward the Lord and toward Israel, and this land shall be yours for a possession before the Lord. But if you will not do so, you will have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. So go ahead and build for yourselves cities and so forth. So now you're in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, and you're reading here, he says, To the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe Manasseh, just associate with that, Numbers 32, and you understand, they have their own promise, they're going to stay on the other side of the Jordan, except that they need to, their soldiers, their warriors, need to go with the tribes and lead the tribes into the promised land, willing to fight with them. And so that's what you're reading about here. Now, to our point, the verbal promise should always be kept. And so what you've got here is a map that I've given to you. And on the map, if you looked at it a little closer, you can't see too much. But here is the half tribe of Israel. This is the land that they're going to inherit. Then you've got the tribe of Gad. They're going to be over here in this area. They take over for the Am Amorites and the Ammonites. And then Reuben has this area for his inheritance over the Moabites and the Midianites. And so I've given you that map just so you kind of realize that's what that map is all about. You've got the two and a half tribes. This is the possession of the land. We'll give you the rest of them later when they actually get in the promised land and God divides the land further. But that is what's going on here when you're reading this. And so these made a commitment before the Lord. And commitments are important. One of my favorite verses in Scripture is James chapter 5, verse 12. And I love the verse. And I'm going to turn to Matthew and read for you something very similar in the book of Matthew. But James says uh, to us in those verses, he says, Let your yes be yes, and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. And literally what he's saying there is that the things we say, and, and God says something very similar to us in Matthew chapter 5, Verses 33 to 37, it's a, it's a similar thing to what James says. Now, I remember, I, I memorized James when I was a youth, a teenager, and, and James 5, 12, above all things, let your yes mean yes and your no, no, why? So that you're not promising or swearing. He says in the book of James, don't swear by any other oath. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. In other words, don't be sitting there saying, well, I promised my mother's grave and I promised this and I promised that. He says, if you say yes, let your yes be yes. If you say no, let your no be no. Now that is some hard, a hard verse to live up to, especially if you're a parent. How many of you have children that come to you and you say no, and then they come back? Come on, uh, come on, guys. And after about 10 minutes, the, the no is now yes, and you've given in. There is a principle in parenting that we used to call the threatening, repeating parents that would sit there and, and, and talk to their children and say, no, you can't, you can't do that, and then they, they finally give in. Or if you do this, we're going to do that. And, and the reality is that you, you should be able to say no to your children and have them listen. And it should be, we used to try to teach our kids first-time obedience. That is, when they come to you and they, you say no, now you, you remind them, what did I say to you before? The answer is no. And unless they give you a reason why the answer should be changed, maybe they have a real valid reason, or if they're just whining and complaining, then you, uh, the appropriate thing would be to then punish them. And we kind of did that with our kids, and they complained it too much, but that was the way it was. But parenting is one of those things that, you know, you're just going to be yes, you know, we know, but in life, you can make a promise someone, this is what I'm promising you, you can make a commitment, and you end up with an omen because you don't follow through on what you have said. It can be to your, your children, it can be to your employees, it can be to your boss, it can be whoever. You say, I'm going to do this for you, and then you never do it. Or in church, in ministry, you can say, well, I'm going to come, well, why don't we have lunch together, let me, let me get you lunch, and you never do it. And those wounds sit there, and they, they hurt. And I would say to someone, if I've ever made a promise to you, and I've wounded you, please come to me and tell me, because sometimes I've said things as a pastor, and I always worry about that, that I say something, and I, I don't follow through. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 and 37. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, 
you shall not make false vows, but you shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you take an oath, make an oath by your head, for you, or for you, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, as yes, and no, no. Anything beyond this is evil. And the reality is that keeping our commitments is something that is really important to God. I'm not going to read the rest of this passage. You can do that on your own. But I just want to challenge you that we are to keep our, our yeses. And if we make commitments to someone, we should ask them, have I ever made an omen to you? Have I ever said something to you? Have I ever promised you something and not follow through with it? And I would say that to all of you today as a pastor. Maybe I've said something to you. Maybe I've talked about us getting together and have never followed through. Then, then, then call me on and say, you know what? Gee, you said we're going to get together. We're going to do lunch. Or we're going to do breakfast. Or we're going to do something. And, and I'd be glad to just to say, you know, you're right. I, I'm sorry. I have sinning against you. And I, I want to turn it around. Or maybe today there's someone who has deeply hurt you. And has made you promises. And they've not kept those promises. Sometimes... People simply forget. I believe it my dad. He just literally forgot about it. And as I got older, it was kind of some kind of silly to remind him of those things. And so I never did. But maybe you're still wounded by something. And, and, and something's really bothering you. Maybe someone has said something or promised you something. Maybe it's time for you to challenge them and, and say, I didn't do something. Or maybe you've got someone that you've thought you've made commitments to and or maybe it's your place to go to your children or to your spouse and say, I've ever made you a commitment that I have not kept. Because we don't want our yes to mean no. And we don't want our no to mean yes. We want our yes to mean yes and our no's to mean no. We want to make a commitment and not have it be an open. And we want to follow because integrity is huge in the Christian life. If you can be followed and trusted, then we should be serving the Lord with our commitments. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says to trust the Lord. You know, when, you, when you're in a situation you don't know how to work out the details, just as being a pastor or being with someone in a situation can be a test or a trial, just the Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. In all your own ways acknowledge Him and God will direct your path. Let Him do that. The last point this morning is, as we, we study through together, we, we realize that, secondly, that we are to challenge others to fill the commitments that they make. The third thing we learn today is to speak your commitments so that others may find faith and strength. Speak your commitments so others can find faith and strength. I remind the story of a pastor. Um, he, he, he put in his report, his annual report, he, said, he puts in there, and he, he speaks before the people, he says, uh, let me just follow along with you here. Eleven, nine people die at sea. And they're thinking in the congregation, nine of us didn't die at sea. Well, he said, several people asked about this. I said, what do you, what do you mean nine, nine, nine of our people died at sea? He said, well, eleven of you came to me and asked for prayers for, your, for the safety of those who were traveling overseas. And two of you came back and said, I, we want you to give thanks for the prayers, but the other nine didn't, so I'm assuming they're all dead at sea, and, 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 the, and the people got the point. And sometimes we need to speak our commitments to others to find the world. In the book of Joshua here, what we're reading here is they answer Joshua after, in verses, let me just finish reading from verse 14. It says, your wives, your little ones, and all your cattle shall remain in the land of which Moses gave you beyond the Jordan, but you shall cross before your brothers in battle array and all your valiant warriors and, you, and, shall, and shall keep them until the Lord gives your brothers rest and he gives you and they also possess the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to your own land and possess that which Moses, the servant of the Lord, has given to you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. They answered Joshua and they said to him, all that you have commanded us, we will do. Joshua reminded them of their commitment. 
they kept by, they stood by their commitment. Their commitment was not going to be an omitment. They were ready to follow through on what they had said. All that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obey Moses and all things, <coughs> so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you, as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your commands and does not obey your words, and all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Now, what do we learn from her? Express your support verbally. It's a good thing to speak forth when you've got a commitment that needs to be made. Just speak it forth. And, and not only did Joshua remind them, but they too come back and they speak forth. We are going to fulfill exactly what we promised. And they even express support for him verbally and unreservedly. They said, you know, if, if any of us do not keep the command which we have promised, we do not obey your words, we should be put to death. How serious is it to make a commitment? No commitments should ever be omitments. They should always be kept and followed through. It should always be something, if we're going to say something, we should mean what we say and say what we mean. And I would challenge you today to think about your own life. Have you made promises? Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your grandchildren. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's your spouse. And you've forgotten all about it, and it's become an omen for you. Maybe you want to spend a moment asking, have I ever committed something to you, that, and I've omitted it, and, and now our relationship is hurting because of it? It's a good thing to find out, because we can do damage. Sometimes we don't even know it. We wear scars from people promising us things, and, and they never fulfill it. Or maybe you want to be bold, and maybe you're not as bold to speak to someone, but you can write them a little note and say, you know, a while back you made me a promise. And, and I'm just kind of hurting because you never kept that promise. You never followed through with it. Whatever it may be. God wants our yes to mean yes. James says, neither swear by heaven or by earth or beyond any other oath. But let your yes mean yes. Let your no be no. Are you willing to commit to that today? Let's pray for you. Lord, I pray for all who have heard this message today because it really is a message that can revolutionize our life if we're willing to stick by what we say and mean what we say and, and do as we said we would do. The integrity of God's people would be so strong, so bold, that others could follow after and believe. And Lord, forgive us when we forget, because we do. Help us to be reminded of what you've called us to do. For those who are here today, Lord, who have made commitments to you this year, maybe it's Bible study or maybe it's prayer, I, I, I pray today that they go to you and, and make it right and begin to study anew. Or Lord, that you would bring us a holy memory a memory of something that we have promised that we've failed to fulfill and we, we are reminded that we are to do something. Let us fulfill the calling in our life. And Lord, as we have promised you to surrender our lives to you, we sang the song all to Jesus, I surrender. May that truly be, have been from our hearts that not just words we sing, but actions we take that, Lord, you're in control of who we are each and every day. Give boldness to the people who are here. Let us love one another as you have loved us. And let us love those who are outside the faith so that they may be one to the faith. We pray in Jesus' name.